Well, thanks, Jerry. Uh, let's get right into our first panel. It sounds like it's going to be uh, very interesting. Uh, you know, these uh, presidential campaigns are somewhat in the news these days. So we have representatives from almost all the major campaigns here, and I think we're going to have a, a very interesting conversation. Uh, my goal was to um, have each of these representatives or panelists give us about five minutes of prepared remarks, and I've got a few zingers to throw at them uh, after they're done with that. And then I'm hoping that each of you will think of a question or two that you might want to ask them. Um, you know, in the spirit of the campaign season, I wouldn't ask a real soft question, you know, try to find one that really goes to the heart of the matter, um, and we'll have a good conversation. So uh, let's start off with, I'm going to introduce each one, uh, let them speak for five minutes, and then I'll introduce the next one, and then we'll get into our questions. So why don't we start with uh, Tom Khalil. Uh, Tom right now is a, an assistant or special assistant, I guess, to uh, the chancellor of the uh, University of Berkeley. He worked in the uh, Clinton administration for a while, also a senior fellow, I guess, with the Center for American Progress. Uh, I guess he doesn't speak officially for the Clinton campaign, but about as close to that as we could, uh, as we could hope for. So Tom, why don't you give us a few thoughts? Uh, thank you, Rick. It's a pleasure for me to be here and see so many um, old friends and colleagues in the audience. Um, I, I've been in California for the last seven years, so this is the first time I'm wearing a tie since 2001. Um, and uh, as Rick uh, mentioned, I, I did have the good fortune to work on issues related to science, technology, and innovation for President Clinton for, uh, for eight years during those dark days of peace and prosperity. Um, and uh, uh, for those of you, and I suspect m many of you fall into this category, who are concerned about issues related to science, technology, and innovation, I think you'd have to say that 2007 was not a great year. Uh, the research and experimentation tax credit lapsed for the 13th time, uh, despite the fact that immigrants are responsible for founding uh, one in four uh, venture-backed, publicly traded firms. Uh, we were not able to make progress on immigration reform and, tr and trying to allow more highly skilled immigrants to stay in the U.S. and contribute to the U.S. economy, despite the fact that both uh, uh, the President and the Congress have been calling for doubling the NSF budget. Uh, this year the Congress increased it by a whopping 1%. Uh, the National Institutes of Health uh, budget is now down 10% in real terms from its uh, 2004 funding level. Congress also cut funding for high energy physics. You might ask, well, why should the Internet community care about that? Um, well, you may have heard of a program called uh, the World Wide Web. Uh, that was developed uh, at CERN, the, the largest particle physics lab in the world, in, in 1989. Uh, and Argonne, uh, which now is going to have to be firing scientists as, as a result of these budget cuts, has really been a leader in the area of uh, grid computing. Well, uh, call me a, a naive optimist, uh, but I believe we can and must do better than this. Uh, and as a senior fellow for this Center for American Progress, uh, last year with uh, my colleague John Irons, um, I, I released a report talking about uh, what I believe the next president should be doing in the areas related to science, technology, and innovation. Uh, and you all have the, uh, the Reader's Digest version of this report on your chair, and I, I hope you uh, download the whole thing. Um, essentially, I argued that these uh, issues related to science, technology, and innovation have to be elevated uh, as national priorities by the next president for, for two reasons. First is that they are critical for economic growth, for job creation, for productivity, which is the driver of our long-term standard of living, uh, and for international competitiveness. The United States does not want to be in the business of competing on the basis of price. We want to be in the business of creating the new products and services, whatever is next, whether that's spintronics or cognitive radio or clean energy or the convergence of bio, info, and nanotechnologies, we want to be at the cutting edge of whatever is next. And the second reason that these issues are important is that no matter what the national goal is, whether it's using information technology to improve energy efficiency and reduce the emission of greenhouse gases, or uh, using, as Jerry mentioned, using information technology uh, to reduce administrative costs and, and medical errors, potentially saving as much as $77 billion, uh, or using new online technologies to allow working adults to uh, balance the com competing demands of work and family and acquire new skills at a time, place, and pace that is convenient for them. Information and communications technologies have 
a really critical role to play in, in meeting these national goals. Um, and what I do in this report, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that the conference organizers have given me two hours to talk about this agenda, uh, is to identify uh, really what I think are, are the critical next steps uh, for the president um, on this agenda related to science, technology, and innovation. And this includes uh, increasing the funding uh, for, for research and development, uh, not only in biomedical research, but also in the physical sciences and engineering. Uh, mobilizing uh, technology and innovation as a way of meeting important national goals, uh, whether it's the production of clean energy or developing new software for middle school math and science, which is as effective as a personalized tutor and compelling as World of Warcraft or Halo 3, uh, whether it's making the research and experimentation tax credit permanent, um, reforming our immigration system so that we uh, uh, double the number of employment-based visas and allow foreign students who are getting an advanced technical degree uh, to stay in the United States once they graduate as opposed to forcing them to go back to their home country, uh, whether it is a national strategy around broadband so that the United States, the birthplace of the internet, uh, is a leader in broadband technology as opposed to being 15th uh, out of OECD countries uh, through uh, supporting creative experiments that are going on at the state and local level, through uh, having tax incentives uh, for companies that invest in uh, next generation broadband technology, stimulating demand uh, for, for broadband and, and making more spectrum available for, for new broadband wireless services as a way of increasing competition in the marketplace. Or importantly, uh, restoring integrity to US science and technology policy so that decisions are made on the basis of, of facts rather than uh, ideology. I'm persuaded that if the next president and the next Congress embrace a national innovation agenda, uh, that the United States will see benefits for decades to come, whether it's in the creation of high wage jobs, development of clean sources of energy that reduce our dependence on foreign oil and accelerate this transition to a low carbon economy, uh, a, a, a real broad range of, of national goals that science, technology, and innovation uh, can help us achieve. Now, obviously, it's the private sector that is ultimately responsible for developing these new products, uh, uh, services, and uh, business models and processes. But the federal government, with the right leadership, can create the environment that will allow US firms and workers to compete and win in the global economy. Um, and I would ask all of you to think about what sort of US economy uh, what sort of world do you want to leave uh, to your children and, and grandchildren and think about what all of us collectively can do to ensure uh, a bright uh, and prosperous future uh, for America. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Well, thanks, Tom. Thanks very much. Our next uh, speaker is Julius Janikowski. Julius, I think, is pretty well known to this group. He's had a variety of roles in the, in the technology community. He's now in the best position of all from a technology community standpoint to be a venture capitalist. That's what we all aspire to. And uh, he's actually, as I just learned this morning, he's uh, been a, a friend and an advisor and a confidant of Barack Obama for a long time, for roughly 20 years. So uh, he's going to speak to us on behalf of the Obama campaign. Julius? Uh, thank you, uh, Rick, and, and thank you, Jerry. And we see where you went. CDT plays such an important role in all of government's issues. Is my, oh, there it is. Good. Uh, uh, yes, the, my, my lesson from law school is be careful who you lose money to at poker because you then owe them favors for a very long time. Um, but I'm, I'm, uh, I've, I've been happy to be associated with Senator Obama for a long time uh, and excited about um, what's been going on over the last year. Uh, technology has been a topic uh, for him for a very long time. Um, uh, I hope some of you have read uh, uh, his book, either of his books. In the second book, there's a chapter on a trip he took to Google a few years ago. Uh, and he writes uh, very interestingly about the effect that it had on him uh, seeing just the, the very visible uh, proof of job creation that comes out of technology and science and ideas. Um, uh, and also spending time, I'm sure almost everyone here has probably been in Google and seen the map of the world with internet usage and 
where the lights uh, shine very brightly and where they don't shine at all. Um, uh, and all of this has helped form his thinking about the technology area. Uh, some of you may, may not know, uh, uh, although if anyone knows, it would be people uh, in this room, I think. In the speech uh, announcing his candidacy last February in Springfield, uh, Senator Obama talked about a lot of things. Uh, but one of the topics that he decided to put in the speech was broadband, um, was reaching for uh, a, a, a communications infrastructure in this country that would reach everyone with true high-speed broadband. And uh, technology has been uh, an important part of the campaign from his perspective. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, he released back at Google uh, a technology and innovation plan uh, that is actually quite uh, long and comprehensive, uh, much uh, uh, too much so for me to try to summarize here. But I think what I'll do is, is, is try to summarize some of the key points in his plan. And I'm sure we'll come back and, and talk a little bit more later. Um, the premise for the plan is that um, uh, technology is critical in thinking about the future of this country, not just thinking about the future of the technology industry, although I'll come back to how important that is, but an understanding that technology will be part of the solution to almost every major issue that the American people care about and that we talk about in this campaign. Whether it's energy, whether it's healthcare, whether it's education, certainly the economy, uh, uh, economic growth, job growth, if we don't get technology policy right in the next administration, we'll not only have a, a, a series of you know, debates that won't go well in, in, in vertical technology issues, but we won't make the progress we need to make on all of these other issues. Um, in his plan itself, um, I would say there are two major elements to it. Um, there is a 21st century infrastructure element to it, uh, a set of proposals to achieve universal broadband, starting with a focus on reforming the Universal Service Fund, um, a commitment to net neutrality, which the Senator has cared about and spoken about um, repeatedly, uh, a commitment in general to open networks, um, uh, a commitment, uh, number two, uh, to open government, and to using technology to uh, uh, improve the functioning of the government both functioning of the provision of services to ordinary citizens uh, and also the fundamental openness, transparency of government. Uh, so you'll see in his proposal um, a, a series of uh, suggestions for uh, uh, putting uh, as much government data as possible, why not all of it, online in easily accessible, searchable ways. Uh, he is responsible for legislation that the Senate passed last year to, to put earmarks online and certain information about lobbyists, and this is, these are areas that he would continue to care about as president. Um, there are a series of suggestions with respect to making the uh, proceedings of federal agencies more open. Um, uh, uh, I, I can come back to that later. Uh, I don't want to get too lost in, in detail. Um, uh, there's a proposal to create the first United States chief technology officer. That's all we um, need. Uh, someone in government who is responsible for making sure that the government communications infrastructure is truly a 21st century infrastructure, that all of the agencies of government are taking full advantage of technology to improve its services and to open up its business uh, in important ways to, uh, uh, to the American people. Um, why don't I stop there, because I know people want to get to, to questions, and um, we'll come back to you. We'll Don't worry, back. Julius. I've got a few zingers already for all you guys. So uh, uh, our next, uh, next speaker is uh, Jules Polonetsky. Jules uh, also has had a, a pretty broad and varied career in the technology industry. I guess uh, worked for uh, Mayor Giuliani in New York for a while in the uh, mayor's uh, administration there, and is uh, going to talk to us today a little bit about the Giuliani perspective on uh, on technology policy. So, Jules. Thank you, and uh, delighted to uh, be uh, part of the conversation given the uh, disappointing events of uh, last night. Uh, I will help, however, that I'll get a pass from any of the zingers given the rough uh, evening that it's been. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I first uh, uh, 
connected with uh, Mayor Giuliani when I was a uh, state legislator in uh, New York, a Democratic state legislator, and saw the dramatic changes in my uh, assembly district, a diverse district of uh, people of all walks of life. And in the uh, three years I was in office, the dramatic immediate change across the board. Uh, and so when I uh, later on joined the uh, administration as the uh, Consumer Affairs Commissioner, um, I began to um, have a, a deeper sense of the mayor's overall philosophy and how it informed many of the decisions he made. And as somebody who in my uh, spare time has spent uh, time helping coordinate the Giuliani campaign's um, technology policy, let me share some of the ideas that informed us uh, in the hope that if uh, the mayor uh, doesn't continue to be in the race. Uh, some of the ideas I think are, are relevant and important and, and perhaps will resonate uh, broadly uh, with uh, other candidates as well. Um, one of the big successes obviously that the mayor claimed in New York was improving the practical quality of life in a way that many skeptics thought couldn't be done. New York City was considered to be a place where too many things were just ingrained and the problem is uh, intractable. And I think what the mayor showed was that with a real determined you know, blunder, bus focused press um, on a whole range of issues, uh, those sorts of problems actually can be solved. And I think one of the problems that many of us who recognize that if the um, web and the internet and web 2.0 and all the things that we're all excited about uh, will continue to flourish for the widest range of users, some of the quality of life online problems that have become, you know, dramatic burdens uh, need to be resolved. The spam, the spyware, the phishing, the farming, the, you know, there's a new funny technical name every day to capture the latest uh, consumer uh, ale. And the argument that, that we who were working on this tech policy were, were assembling was that we need that same sort of quality of life online focus today. Uh, and again, it, it's the kind of stuff that people, I think, think, well, it can't be done. It's such a hard problem. It's happening overseas. There's technical issues. Nobody governs this stuff. Um, but I think our argument was that just like the um, quality of life criminals, the fair beaters, the broken windows theory, the folks who, um, uh, the squeegee, you know, man who made life difficult for people at red lights, the uh, street muggers, the graffiti artists. And one of the ways it was successful was this was something that you knew that no matter what agency or connection you had to technology or to crime, um, it was your job to carry out the agenda. As the Consumer Affairs Commissioner, I didn't have a lot of crime enforcement authority. But I did have authority over things like the sale of box cutters to minors, things like how stores were securing uh, spray paint, um, a whole range of things that made a practical difference to the quality of life. And so I knew that those items had to be a core part of my agenda. And here today, when the solution to spam and spyware and phishing is such a necessarily you know, non-denominational type of thing, it's government agencies, it's law enforcement, it's local law enforcement, it's the FBI, it's you know, the local cop on the beat taking the identity theft complaint seriously, the national law enforcement folks being involved, businesses playing you know, the key part they have, you know, the idea of legislation where there are gaps that perhaps uh, need a fill in uh, and where there are enforcement challenges. Uh, and so um, I'm hoping that those ideas uh, are ideas that uh, continue to resonate. Um, I think the other uh, uh, piece that is also critically important, uh, and again, this is one that resonated with us given the mayor's you know, history with organized crime and the mafia. A lot of these ills today obviously have moved from being you know, the rogue marketer who's got a list of emails and is spamming away. Um, it's become a organized crime syndicated type of operation with people outsourcing experts who are uh, great at uh, writing mails, experts who are great at um, controlling huge numbers of uh, co uh, computers that they control all the world, uh, experts who uh, are expert at getting the stolen information and then figuring out how to use it. It's become an incredibly efficient, worldwide, globally distributed uh, business with criminals playing a key part. Uh, and so the solution over there simple law enforcement or spam filters or the like, clearly the solution for such a significant problem takes the kind of efforts that it took perhaps to bring down the mafia to focus on organized crime as more than, hey, let's arrest someone because they beat up a, you know, a guy in a store. Wait a second, this was a shakedown. It's part of a much bigger operation. Uh, and that sort of concerted uh, plan. Um, 
given uh, you know, uh, evidence over the last couple of years of, of Al-Qaeda and other uh, perhaps uh, uh, governments that, that want to cause harm, uh, using as well their uh, technical uh, ability to um, um, poke at US government agencies looking for information to test some of the um, um, defenses in the private sector, and you all know as, as well as I what a huge portion of the private sector is responsible for some of the key strategic assets, whether it's nuclear pants or power pants. Uh, when we all saw the government of Estonia, you know, brought to a halt by, you know, what may have been uh, attackers from a, a foreign government, uh, I think it was a wake up call to lots of folks that this isn't science fiction anymore. We are living in the reality of, you know, cyber warfare and that the appropriate responses are necessary. Anyway, I uh, hope that's a, uh, a couple of uh, useful thoughts and look forward to continuing to engage. Great. Thanks, Jules. Appreciate it very much. And our, our last speaker is uh, Doug holtz -Eakin. Doug is a full-time uh, member of the uh, Man McCain uh, campaign team right now. Uh, I think it's a little unclear whether they're all being paid or they're not all being paid, but I have a feeling they're all going to be paid very soon. Uh, and he's going he's to talk to us about, the, uh, about Senator McCain's uh, policies on technology. Well, thank you, Rick and, and Jerry and, and Tim. I'm you know, delighted to be here this morning, uh, uh, slightly sleep deprived, uh, and, but, but pleased to report that uh, through the wonders of the internet, we raised $500,000 between midnight and my arrival, um, <laughs> raising the prospects that my pay raise uh, is somewhere in the future. Um, but, uh, you know, I am uh, relatively new to this community, but the senator certainly is not. He's a man who has a, a long track record of uh, interest and uh, fascination, quite frankly, with the, the innovation that has been characterized uh, by this group. Uh, and he has a tremendous respect for uh, the market-driven innovation and growth that has been at the, the foundation of, of what we've seen in the past and, and will be very important in the years to come. And uh, a central part of what he is trying to accomplish in his run for the presidency is to ensure the continued improvement in the competitiveness of our information technology sector in the U.S. economy as a whole. Uh, he's committed, uh, unlike any other candidate, to pr providing access to global markets uh, not taking a step backwards in our uh, efforts to uh, open markets to the 95% of the world's uh, consumers who are outside the American borders. He is uh, committed to ensuring that our companies can uh, compete in those markets uh, by ensuring adequate uh, dedication of basic research funding in the United States. Uh, the Senator has for a long time been on record in opposition to earmarking those research funds, making sure they are allocated on the basis of sound science and uh, genuine national priorities. Uh, he has proposed that we should immediately uh, cut the corporation income tax from 35% to 25%. Uh, the United States has become a tax-unfriendly location on the globe. We need the world's best companies to be in the United States, stay here, grow here. Uh, allow uh, companies to immediately write off in the first year the cost of their equipment investment so as to uh, provide adequate investment in physical capital. Uh, he has proposed a new permanent uh, R&D tax credit. Uh, the senator has uh, a deep appreciation of the need for uh, investment in the, the intellectual capital is at the foundation of this. He's also quite sick of the charade whereby lawmakers hold up uh, companies for campaign contributions each year to get another extender uh, in the R&E tax credit. It's time to end this, uh, put a foundation for solid growth underneath uh, the innovation part of our agenda. Um, he, he is uh, more than anyone else quite cognizant of the importance of the immigration issue. Um, there is no one in the McCain campaign who lets the word immigration come out of their mouth casually anymore. And I will tell this group what the senator has told each group he's met. Uh, the very first priority of his administration will be to secure the border. Uh, the American people spoke and spoke clearly uh, this past spring uh, when the, the efforts at comprehensive immigration reform grounds will halt. Uh, they have uh, demanded that the southern border be secure, and that will be his first step prior to uh, undertaking any other aspect of immigration reform. Uh, a lesson that came from that episode is that the American people have uh, lost a basic trust that their government will fulfill its promises. Uh, they did not believe the promise in the bill that the border would be secure. Uh, they don't believe uh, that uh, Congress is genuinely pursuing its national priorities, that instead, uh, through the, the visible corruption that came from earmarks and pork barrel, uh, 
special interests were dominant. Uh, the senator is committed to restoring the trust that American taxpayers should have in their government. He, he is committed to an, an openness and a transparency in the government that will help to restore that trust. Um, certainly, there should be greater access to, to government information. Uh, in the state of Indiana, for example, every government contract is online, and you can see how the, the contracts have been uh, let, who the recipients are. There's no reason why this shouldn't be something that the federal government could pursue. Uh, on the campaign trail itself, we have seen, you know, and he, he, he revels in the, the openness and transparency that comes with sitting on the Straight Talk Express, uh, having everyone out there with a, a cell phone taking video of, of events. It, it's tough for politicians to be on the record 24-7, but it's a good thing for democracy. Uh, it has spread American democracy around the globe. People get to see how we do business here. Uh, it is uh, a campaign that is important because we know that uh, others with, with less benign intent, uh, such as uh, Osama bin Laden himself, are using the same technologies to, to spread a, a message that is very different. Uh, so the senator is committed to the growth and competitiveness of information technology. He's committed to using it to improve the governance of the United States, the spread of our ideals around the globe. Uh, he will uh, ensure that we have uh, vigorous competition in markets for broadband and broadband content. Uh, improve access to Americans, uh, uh, to improve the access of all Americans in this area, and uh, is looking forward to working with this group and many others uh, during the remainder of the campaign and uh, uh, pursuing these goals for America. Great. Leave Thanks, it. Doug. Thanks very much. Well, let me start off with just a general question, and maybe I'll start with you, Tom, and then we can just kind of jump around. But, um, you know, if you look back at the last 20 or 25 years, you realize that, and I, I don't think anybody in this room would disagree, that the uh, you know, the American technology experience has really been one of the great, remarkable achievements, uh, really, of the American economy. And, and uh, it's hard to argue that there's really ever been an economy in the world or a government set up to promote innovation quite as well as we've done it. We might not quite know exactly why we do it so well, but the fact is we've done it extremely well. In fact, we've done it so well that the uh, founders of some of these companies are now retiring when they're 50 years old so they can spend the rest of their life giving away their money. So we've not only have we created a new industry, right. we've created enormous wealth, and we've also done it in a way with an architecture that kind of, you know, um, uh, spreads U.S. ideals around the world. You know, the Internet's a very individualized, uh, you know, each person for himself sort of... Uh, sort of technology and so really it's been a remarkable success. Given that record of success, um, why do we need to have a big government a program to promote something that's been so successful more or less on its own? Why, why should the government get in there and, and, uh, and mess things up? Okay, well, so first of all you have to ask the question where did these technologies come from? Uh, so if you look at the, uh, if you look at the internet uh, that is the outgrowth of investments that the government started making in the 1960s with the ARPANET and continuing through the 1980s with the uh, NSFNet. Um, the first graphical web browser was developed at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. Uh, all the technologies for, many of the technologies for uh, the chip industry, such as VLSI, were developed uh, by government-supported university research. So there's no question that uh, what makes the United States innovation system strong is an entire ecosystem. And the elements of that ecosystem include um, a competitive environment, an entrepreneurial culture. U.S. Uh, citizens are far more likely than their counterparts in Europe to be interested in starting their own business. Um, very deep capital markets. Uh, you know, we get the lion's share of the venture capital investment. Uh, but part of that uh, ecosystem is uh, government support for uh, long-term uh, research and development that goes beyond the time horizons of individual firms. Um, there's also important roles that the government can play in ensuring that more Americans enjoy the benefits of these technologies. Uh, so th that's why I think a lot of the, the efforts of the Clinton administration to address the digital divide were, were very important so that uh, you would have much broader access to uh, information and communications technology. So absolutely the private sector plays an important role, but if you look at where these technologies come from, uh, many of them have uh, roots in federally supported university-based research. Well, that, you know, that's a great point. I would have to say the one thing I always thought the government could do to be helpful is uh, fund basic research. I think that's one of the, one of the areas that they really, uh, where we've really seen a lot of success. 
Um, I'm not sure I see too many others, though. What do you think, Doug? What else, other than the funding basic research, what can the government do to try to promote innovation? I mean, you know, you might say that, that government and innovation don't necessarily go together, but what do you think? Well, uh, you do have to maintain the healthy climate for uh, uh, risk-taking innovation, uh, capital markets, uh, not over-regulating. Uh, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley was, uh, you know, a step that, that we took uh, in the uh, aftermath of some real serious problems in uh, corporate malfeasance, but uh, in some cases it's really overstepped and the burden on small uh, businesses has become quite large. Uh, you know, we need to look at those issues. Uh, so uh, we need to keep healthy capital markets. Uh, we need to keep the regulation light. Uh, setting, setting an environment that, that you know, uh, where the government isn't the risk you're managing. You, you know what the tax laws are going to be. Um, settle that, you know, the R&D tax credit is a classic example. Um, the government can do all those things, funds basic research, keeps markets open. We face a real serious issue in a rising tide of protectionism around the globe, uh, protecting intellectual property at home and abroad, and making sure that when the American worker shows up at the, at the office, they have high skills, making our education system work better. Too many young Americans aren't graduating from high school, and when they do, aren't prepared to go to college. That's a central issue for the future and one we can't let slide. If I could add a couple of things to that. Yeah, well, actually, I wanted to ask you in particular. Because, go ahead, and I'll, I'll follow up, because well, I had a couple of questions for uh, you. A, a few things. There's no question that the growth of the technology industry in this country over the last 20 years has been a tremendous success and a driver of economic growth. But there's some other things that are true as well that we have to keep in mind in forming policy. One is uh, the benefits of that growth have been unequal. There is a digital divide. We are underutilizing technology to help with education, to help with health uh, care, um, and to start addressing the energy issues that we know we have. Um, one of the major things that the next administration should do is be very creative and focused on generating investment dollars going into clean technologies. Uh, one of the things that Senator Obama has proposed is exactly that. Uh, 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 you, you're probably familiar with the InQtel, which was the CIA uh, uh, sponsored venture capital firm that uh, uh, invested uh, significant sums of money in technologies that ultimately were thought to be helpful to American intelligence gathering activities and other CIA activities. It's considered to be uh, um, a success. Um, it led to both successful companies and the generation of technologies that helped uh, our intelligence gathering. We need to do something like that around clean energy for all the obvious reasons. Um, the other uh, uh, point that I wanted to make in connection with what you were saying is that um, the technology revolution hasn't come yet to segments of our economy in our country and we need to extend it there. It also hasn't really come to government. And um, uh, a focus on using technology to bring our government into the 21st century, uh, to put information online, to improve services to citizens, uh, is something that uh, uh, we've just been too late on. Uh, and I think this is something we feel in all of our lives as individual citizens, the associations or companies that we're associated with. Um, one of the things that I'd encourage people to take a look at is what uh, the Obama campaign has um, done to begin transforming, use technology to transform campaigning. Uh, we all know that in the last couple of cycles there have been uh, uh, steps taken to change the way technology is used in campaigns um, and there's uh, probably people are familiar with the ways in which technology is used to generate um, uh, fundraising online um, which I would say is a very good thing because it gives people uh, who aren't necessarily in Washington and aren't necessarily able to write big checks to participate through um, uh, uh, helping candidates raise the money that they need to compete uh, but the Obama campaign has done a series of other things that are interesting and that in some ways are a, a sort of beta for what uh, uh, how an Obama administration would use technology in, in, in government. Uh, one is the, the, the campaign has been creative about you know, using uh, very current Web 2.0 technologies to create platforms that allow people to interact with the campaign in ways other than giving money. Uh, created a platform where people can um, uh, create groups on their own uh, can organize meetings. Um, if I have the numbers correct, I think about 13,000, 15,000 groups have been created spontaneously online at BarackObama.com. 
five, six, seven thousand meetings have been organized spontaneously. Uh, and the campaign has been experimenting with using its website to take in policy suggestions from ordinary Americans. Uh, 15,000 policy ideas have come in through the online site and of course the campaign is struggling with how to process and, and, uh, uh, and fairly consider the ideas that have come in. Um, but, they are, but the ideas do get looked at and they do become part of um, uh, policy making. Uh, Senator Obama gave a major speech on health care a few months ago uh, and he started the speech by telling the story of um, a family who's, uh, where the father had been working, uh, developed cancer, lost his job, had the classic health insurance problems, uh, and went on to suggest some things that the government needed to do. Um, that story and the ideas associated with it actually came to the campaign through its online policy platform. So as successful as we've been in this country in technology over the last 20 years, I think we're very much at the beginning of it and the list of things that we need to do is very long. Well, I will say, I, I, you know, that's a great point. I do think that uh, there's a lot the government can do to take advantage of these technologies that are out there and use them in a better way, whether we want, you know, uh, White House policy being set by 15,000 emails in there. I don't know if you spend any time reading the blogs, you wouldn't really go that direction, you know, for, uh, <laughs> for technology policy. But let me ask you this, and I, and I want to get other people's perspective on this too. You know, um, you mentioned that uh, maybe we ought to have a CTO of the federal government. And, uh, you know, I can certainly see a CIO, a guy whose job is to take advantage of technology, but a CTO is a guy who kind of sets national technology policy, and maybe there's a role for that too. But um, do we want to have a CTO who decides, as you suggest, that uh, we ought to be focusing more investment in a particular area, perhaps in green technology, you know, which is certainly something that's being invested in big time by the private sector. Um, is, is that a role that government is good at? Is that? Uh, can we appoint somebody who works for the government, a politically appointed person, who can help us make decisions about uh, you know, where these investments are best put, or is that something that maybe the private sector is better at? The, the, the private sector is great at allocating capital where markets work efficiently. And the private sector can't be relied on where, for one reason or another, there's market failure in connection with investment. And there are a series of uh, very long-term objectives that we know we have as a country that we can't assume the market will solve. We can't assume that venture firms or private equity firms that need to have a return in five to seven years are going to make investments that have 20-year payoffs. But we need those kinds of investments now. We need them in the energy sector and it's completely appropriate for government to identify those areas and then come up with market-sensitive ways to put money into those areas. And so the InQtel example, I think, uh, is a good one, an example of something that's worked. Um, number one, number two, and Tom is right about this, there's a very long history of, uh, of, of basic R&D that's required in the part of the government. Um, uh, lightly managed, heavily managed, we can debate how far along, but there's no question that um, we've seen enormous benefits of that over the years. They won't come from uh, uh, my private sector capital allocation decisions alone and there's absolutely a role for government to play. It should be played in a way that's very sensitive to um, uh, uh, smart capital allocation decisions. And, um, uh, uh, and so there are things that the government has done in the past that can be models for what it should do in the future. And there are new ways to allocate, for the government to allocate capital that should be tried in the next administration. I, I think it's important to make a distinction between means and ends. So I think it's very important to accelerate the transition to a low carbon economy. Uh, obviously, one of the ways to do that is through some sort of uh, cap and trade regime to establish the right rules of the game to eliminate uh, the kind of negative externalities that are associated with the emission of greenhouse gases. But I think there's a distinction that's important to make between the government saying, look, we have an interest in making the transition to a low carbon economy and we have an interest uh, in cr creating the right rules so that the private sector has an incentive to invest in these technologies and to reduce their emission of greenhouse gases and to be investing in a broad portfolio of technologies that are going to help get us there on the one hand and, ha and having the government say, you know, we know what the answer is, it's the hydrogen economy. Uh, because I think when the government does that, uh, it's almost assuredly likely to, to get it wrong. 
uh, and I think the, the also the thing uh, with uh, uh, climate change is that anyone who's looked at this will tell you that there's no one single technology that's going to get there. It's you know it's a combination of, of energy efficiency and renewables and carbon sequestration. So I think you are right to to be cautious about the government saying you know we know what the right answer is. It's to create the environment in which these solutions are going to emerge in a, in a bottom up entrepreneurial fashion. Okay, I appreciate that. Doug, did, or uh, Jules, did you guys have a comment on that? And then I have another topic I want to get into. Go ahead, Alf. Well, I, I, I want to echo a lot of what Tom just said. I mean, I think it's that on the mark that uh, you have to set up uh, a stable set of rules that uh, give the, the, the freedom to, for the private sector to go solve a big problem. And uh, the Senator's on record as proposing uh, a cap and trade. He's introduced it in two successive Congresses. Uh, that would set the top-line architecture necessary to give the appropriate incentives. Uh, it is not a good government policy to have ethanol subsidies. It's not a good government policy to have tariffs against Brazilian ethanol. Uh, that, that sort of targeted handout, in the end, interferes with efficient markets. Uh, you should you know, send the message to the, the markets that uh, carbon has a price, uh, and then let the, the market innovate to uh, move away from carbon and other greenhouse gases. It's, it's very simple. Uh, health information technology gets tons of uh, attention, and everyone agrees, God, what a wonderful thing. But there is no business model for it, uh, given the way, for example, Medicare pays bills. It, it's a fee-for-service system. We pay doctors to do things to people. The best way to be the doctor who gets to do things to people is to have their records. It is their business model not to share, it's their business model to have it. Then you gotta go back to that guy and, and have the next thing done to you. If we pay doctors to have people be healthy and we pay for uh, coordinated care across hospitals and doctors, a lot of evidence that would be cheaper, have just as good an outcome, and there would be a financial incentive to share information between the hospitals and the doctors. We've had government regulation that prohibited that. We've gotta get that out of the way. We've gotta have payment systems in Medicare that promote that. And then the market will develop fabulous and innovative health uh, information technologies that will deliver health care to Americans uh, with a higher quality and lower cost. I mean, that's the role for government. Okay. Well, let me pick up on uh, Julius's mention of the uh, CTO and, and the mention of you know, the need for data to flow uh, appropriately. Uh, one of the things that, that we'd been kicking around on the technology group on the Giuliani side was uh, we said, you know, here the mayor clearly is going to um, have a strong focus on law enforcement and as a prosecutor who's you know, used subpoenas, uh, a, a general support for access to the kind of information needed for law enforcement. And when you look at all the you know, issues that have flagged up between the law enforcement and civil liberties flap, um, rarely has it been, wait a second, the actual data that may have been useful to catch a bad guy is something that somebody on either side of the divide didn't want, right? It was about process, and I don't mean process in a, you know, that doesn't matter, right? It's the process in this area is important. It's what level of, uh, of subpoena, what level of, uh, of request, what kind of oversight and review. And so um, we said, well, how do we help integrate a strong law and order make sure that you know, a 9-11 doesn't happen again, give the agencies the authority they need without you know, really spending the next years just banging heads over so. And, and we said, well, what about the notion of a chief privacy officer? And of course, tailored a little bit by the, the roles I've played as chief privacy officer, but the reality is it's one of the areas in government where I think uh, bipartisan, one would agree that there's been success. But, you know, Nulo Kano Kelly is one of the first CTOs at Homeland Security, you know, mandated by Congress, you know, set a tone. Agencies today, you know, from, from uh, um, for Jane Horvath uh, and the job she did at Justice, uh, um, uh, CPOs, I think, have been um, quite successful uh, at helping focus and have a senior uh, executive at each agency saying, you know what, this is part of our mission. It's not a compliance thing. It is part of our mission to actually make sure that at a high level people are thinking and asking the hard questions. And so the process failures that have happened um, are the ones that have that sort of check and balance. And so the argument that we do need this when there's so many issues, even broader than just the national security ones, you know, uh, not necessarily regulating on health issues, but having a um, uh, a government-wide focus of, well, if we are going to you know, be rolling back barriers to make sure that uh, data can be, who's thinking and making sure that there's a vetting and a, and a thoughtful process? Uh, and for those of you in the private sector, you know, you, you know that 
there are people who make bad decisions, but usually it's a decision that nobody made. Oh my God, data was released. Nobody decided it was a good idea or that it was inappropriate to have a set of you know, controls in place and afterwards everybody gets their act together. And so having a federal level chief privacy officer expanding on I think a lot of the good work that a lot of the local CPOs have been doing uh, I think is a, a fairly useful uh, idea. Um, well, I'll tell you what, you know, we've only got about 15 minutes left, so I'd like to at least uh, check and see whether there's a question or two that might come from the audience. I've got another uh, few things we could ask, too, but if uh, I'd love to get some questions from the audience, if there's, it looks like there's one right here. So, Tim, if you could. Bob Samors from the uh, State University Land Grant College Association. Um, science, technology, and innovation uh, sort of fell off the table at the last minute in the 08 appropriation cycle. And I wanted to find out from the panelists um, what you think is missing from our approach and what you think the uh, campaigns can do to raise the profile and importance of these issues in front of the general public. So, uh, you know, my, my take on that is uh, that presidential leadership is very important. Uh, so, you know, when we were having negotiations with the, with the Congress over appropriations issues, we would say, look, there are certain things that uh, you know, we need to have or the president is not going to assign, uh, you, unfortunately, usually the omnibus appropriation bill that would wrap together you know, eight or nine different bills. So I think presidential leadership is very important. I think in terms of what it is that the, uh, the campaigns can do is that they need to make the linkages uh, in people's minds between science, technology, and innovation and things that the American people care about, uh, whether it's uh, job creation, reducing our dependence on, on foreign oil, uh, and uh, making the types of improvements to our healthcare system that we've, that we've been talking about, uh, reducing administrative costs uh, and reducing and medical errors. So I think the, the candidates have an obligation uh, to paint a, a vision for uh, what the future of our economy and our society can look like uh, when we have the right sorts of policies in place. Other thoughts on that one? No? Um, any other, another question from the audience? Yeah. Oh, Jerry, this probably is a zinger, so be careful, guys. This guy's an attack dog. Not a zinger. Uh, just that there, there really has been, I don't want to over-regulate the internet, but there has been a growing debate and a growing consensus among industry and and consumer organizations that we do need baseline privacy legislation to deal with the internet. Um, sometimes that's it's counterintuitive since the government is one of the big demanders of, of that's putting pressure on privacy. But I'd like to hear uh, where the campaigns are on that issue and whether we could ever move it uh, 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 to the front of a, a legislative agenda and a policy initiative. Right. Oh, nice. Senator McCain has uh, a long history in this area and uh, was a leader in the Do Not Call Registry, and, and, but has always believed that this is not uh, a, a function exclusively of the government dictating rules on privacy, that, that self-regulation and uh, codes, of, codes of best practice in the private sector are part of this solution, and, and certainly he'd continue in that tradition. Oh, uh, no, go ahead, Tom. No, go ahead. No, no, it's, uh, uh, I think privacy is one of those areas where there's tremendous frustration out there among ordinary people. We all, you know, are checking boxes every day on very long disclosures that no one reads, and then we really don't know what's happening with that information, and the enforcement of any misuses to the extent that there are clear rules around what's an appropriate and inappropriate use has been pretty lax. So there's a compelling need for uh, a revisiting of uh, how we approach privacy. Uh, we're in a very different world. We can't put the, you know, the genie of uh, information, personal information, back in the bottle. It's there. It's on the internet. It's there because it's collected. It's there because most people give it voluntarily anyway. Um, I, I, I started my first job in Congress. I was very disclosure oriented. I, I, uh, um, uh, I, I worked for Congressman Chuck Schumer at the time and was responsible for his credit card disclosure legislation and became a big believer in the benefits of disclosure. Um, but pure disclosure is not working as well as it should be in the privacy area because of, of, of all the things that we're dealing with. So I suspect that we'll probably have to shift some of our focus to 
uh, putting appropriate regulations on the use of information that are in the hands of companies or in the hands of governments, using technology to help uh, uh, with audits and to help make, um, uh, uh, make a system workable. Um, and, and the next administration, I think, uh, will have to take a fresh look at the enforcement budgets of the Federal Trade Commission and other, other agencies that have privacy-related enforcements and make sure they were organized to take, uh, to take it seriously. This is an area where um, a small number of well-handled enforcement actions of clearly written rules um, can help eliminate some of the excesses that we've been seeing. So is it your, your sense is that they don't need baseline privacy legislation? Or, uh, I think, they, I, I think baseline they privacy legislation is needed okay. because there, is the, 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 there isn't a coherent privacy system uh, right now that's working. I got it. Okay. Other thoughts on that issue? Another question. Yes, ma'am. Although Mr. Holtzikin mentioned IP protection in passing while he was speaking, no one has mentioned the, I guess, the governmental organization responsible for, uh, at least in part, uh, IP protection, that is the USPTO. And um, although you have mentioned the investments that many companies make, and of course the investments that they make usually result in patents that they can either get protection from other um, uh, infringers or they can get license fees. So it's obviously a big deal for parties to invest and then to get patents. The, the USPTO has been under uh, a lot of uh, criticism recently for a number of reasons, one of which is uh, the leadership that has been put into place by the administration, not only the current administration, but the prior administration, that they appoint people that don't have any patent experience. And so my question for the various candidates is, you know, what do, 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 do any of the people or any of the candidates have plans for um, either the leadership of the PTO or IP policy in general, uh, given the interest that everyone has in growing technology and the importance of IP to this country? Oh, I'm, my name is Shannon Hansen. I'd say two things in that regard. Uh, the first and, and the, the threshold issue is the quality of the appointments that the president makes. Uh, you know, an example that uh, the senator has harped on a lot, so it's now familiar to people, is the, the problem of uh, earmarks in, in legislation. Agency heads often request those earmarks, and uh, the next president will have to have an ag uh, agency heads that, that do not, that support uh, a budget process that is focused on national priorities and not on uh, pur the pursuit of these self-interest uh, legislation. Uh, so the leadership of the Patent Office in particular will be uh, an, an important uh, presidential appointment. And, and you are as good as the people you choose to surround yourself. It's always about the people in an organization. So I think that is the threshold question. It is also true that the basic patent infrastructure needs fixed. Uh, the US uh, uh, patent laws need to be re reformed. There, are, uh, there is legislation uh, in Congress right now. It's, it's, it's badly needed. Uh, what's in the Senate is, is very good. Uh, maybe not perfect, but very good. And uh, uh, that should be something that, should, that the Congress should move forward on. Um, <clears throat> again, I, I'm here representing the Center for American Progress as opposed to any particular candidate. But I, I would say that I think the PTO needs additional resources to help address the patent backlog, patent backlog. I think that there are also some issues with the improving the quality of the patents uh, so that you don't have patents that, that get issued which are uh, obvious and, and overly broad. I think there's been uh, a real problem with that. You know, there's just this uh, patent issued that claims to cover all of smartphone technology, um, for example. Um, and I think there's some really interesting experiments going on uh, in tapping, tapping the distributed expertise of the country when it comes to reviewing prior art. So there's a pilot project that uh, NYU is involved in, uh, which is trying to open source uh, the process of ad identifying prior art. Uh, and if that's successful, I think that's something that should be expanded as a way of improving patent quality. Sure. I was, I was going to mention that program too, and I think, I think Tom is right. The PTO is an example of an, of an agency that surprisingly has historically made really poor use of technology. Um, so here our patent agency is not taking advantage of technology to do its work better. And I'm familiar with that, with the pilot program, uh, and it's the kind of thing that uh, is worth exploring and expanding at the PTO 
uh, and taking similar pilot programs to other federal agencies to encourage better use of technology in tapping broader expertise and making better decisions. Other thoughts on that? Let me, I'll, I'll come back to the audience for one more if we have a chance, but I wanted to ask this question. You know, um, we've all been watching these campaigns in Florida and New Hampshire and stuff, and we've noticed that technology issues are right on the fore. They're driving votes right and left, and frankly, they're not going to drive any votes in the general election either. Do our candidates really care about this? There really doesn't seem to be a big public, um, you know, drive, certainly at election time, to drive votes one way or another because of technology issues. Um, what do we need to do to really raise it to the right level, or, or do we need to be concerned about that? It, again, I think it depends on the way that it's framed. I think that if you view technology policy as its own ghetto, then you're only going to reach a small audience. I think what you see, though, is that when the candidates are talking about energy, uh, they're talking about the need to have technologies that drive this trans, uh, transition to a, large, uh, a low carbon economy, when they're talking about healthcare, they're talking about the opportunities to use IT to reduce administrative costs, medical errors, and improve the management of, of chronic care. Uh, when they're talking about education, they're talking about uh, the need to improve the quantity and quality of K through 12 math and science teachers to provide uh, more scholarships at the undergraduate and graduate level uh, for science and engineering. So you don't see a lot of people standing up and giving long uh, speeches exclusively on science and technology. Instead, I think for uh, many of the candidates, it's become a cross-cutting theme. I, I think that's exactly right. I think uh, I'm not sure if I'm if I'm on. Um, uh, I know Senator Obama, and I don't want to characterize other people's speeches and statements, but uh, in every major uh, speech that he's given on topics that clearly are major voting issues, energy, education, the economy. Technology has been a part of it. Uh, I think people are very hungry for a 21st century president who knows how to take advantage of 21st century tools to do all the work that needs to be done. They care about the quality of their kids' education. They care about uh, bringing costs down uh, in the health uh, world. They understand that uh, uh, we're in a different global economy now, uh, that technology is part of it. Uh, and that we need a president who's going to steer us through that um, in a smart, sophisticated way. So, uh, so you know, uh, so so no, uh, the, the technology isn't being ghettoized, but by any of the candidates. But I think that's a good thing, and I think it reflects uh, the general importance that that, uh, that that is put to technology as part of the solution to all of our problems. I guess the other thing I'd say is on this issue of uh, uh, transparent. Uh, an accountable government, um, you do hear uh, certainly Senator Obama talking about the importance of using technology uh, to open up uh, government and to change the way the government is run and operated. Mm -hmm. uh, the brief comment I'd add to that is there's an interesting generational thing I think that's going on here. You know, for an older generation, very hard to, to suggest that someone's going to be voting for a president based on, you know, patent policy, right? People have this general sense that he's here on Iraq and here's the economy and he's in line with my social values and that sort of thing. For the younger generation where it isn't about technology, they've grown up with this, these are the tools of life. The, the fact that they're interacting on MySpace or Facebook isn't, oh, there's technology involved here. That, that is uh, something they've had access to. My six-year-old just asked for a Facebook account, which is kind of scary. Um, th this is part of their life. My, my four-year-old you know, is more comfortable typing today, you know, picking out uh, her name on the computer you know, than I was in college. And so I think for the generation that's, that's younger, it's not about tech issue policy per se, but it's do these candidates get what my life is about? Are they putting information? How are they? You've seen as much coverage of, uh, you've probably seen more coverage of how the candidates are using technology and their blogs and transparency and are they Twittering and all that sort of thing than you have perhaps about their substantive policy. And I think because that's what's resonating. Are these people who are, who get what my life is like in terms of the way I live in this interconnected world with all my friends and this larger audience. Sure. And just if I could just bump in on, on that point quickly, um, uh, one of the issues that you do see people care about is the, uh, the challenges to parents in um, a home in which digital media comes in in all sorts of ways. You know, our parents had it easy. When I was growing up, there were three broadcast television channels and there were a couple of TVs in the house and this wasn't very complicated. And, you know, I have, I have a 16-year-old now and uh, 
it's, a, it's a whole new world out there. I think parents are very concerned. The problems that parents in digital, dealing with digital media and who are suggesting ways are uh, respectful of the First Amendment, but that also empower parents who really want to do exercise their, their responsibilities as parents. Uh, let me repeat all of that and just make the, the last The technology has the campaigns work because Americans now have the chance to, to genuinely check the authenticity of these candidates, that the, the transparency, that the real way they're not uh, electing a patent policy and, and the city of that leader. Um, and, and it spans generations. I mean, one of the, one of the senators, you know, uh, favorite moment in any campaign trail is when he proudly displays on his picture of he and his daughter, Megan, at her graduation from Columbia University, which he refers to as the single most expensive um, <laughs> to uh, 96 now, and, and that's part of the campaign and the campaign policies. Great. Well, I think we're out of time, according to Jim, so would you please join me in giving this panel a round of applause for what I thought was very interesting. Thank you. 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 Thank you.